Hey there, good evening and happy Wednesday. Charles Wolin, Joel Soria here with you again in studio, episode number 13. We've made it to lucky 13, Joel. Yeah, we have. Uh, delighted to be here again and happy belated birthday, Charles. <laughs> it was your birthday over the weekend, so wanted to take advantage to, to wish you a happy birthday in front of everyone. He's slowly making me blush, but I'll, I'll, I'll work on it here. <laughs> uh, the Quake. Uh, uh, lost a, a match uh, on the East Coast this last weekend against the New England Revolution by a scoreline of three goals to one. Let's take a look here at the quote from Matias Almeida on the takeaway from the game. He says, it was a match that became complicated in the beginning after they scored from mistakes we made, but we had several opportunities to tie the match and even win if we had converted the chances we created. We controlled the match, but it became difficult when they stayed back and defended well. Our goal came late in a complicated match. So I bring it to you, Joel Soria. What do you make of the game and what do you think of the coach's comments here? Well, yeah, we were able to speak uh, with Matias Almeida today after practice, and I think he said it right, you know, that the team played well. They played a lot better than the scoreline uh, made it seem like at the end of the day after, the, after 90 minutes, but they were unfortunate. And we go back to a lot of the reasons why the earthquakes have fell behind in certain games, and that's just lack of concentration in those, you know, defining moments, right? The... Yeah. Revs didn't really have the ball. I mean, the possession says it, you know, it's 76% for the Earthquakes, 24 for the Revs. And obviously the Revs were going with, with a, going on with a lot of internal turmoil, right? You know, the, the sacking of Brad Friedel. And then at that time, obviously they already had Bruce Arena lined up to take over. But during that time, the players had, you know, the ability, the Revs players had the ability to showcase their skills you know, to, to live another day, to, to breathe in, you know, fresh air. Right. And that really benefited them, right? They were, they were able to, to play to their advantages. They, they weren't really pressing on the quakes. They weren't taking on and, and trying to, trying to minimize the quakes the way that other teams did it. And they took advantage of, of the few, few, very few, uh, situations that they created for themselves and at the end of the day the Quakes just weren't potent enough in the attack and you know it's it's three points that are, might come back and haunt the Quakes uh, later on. Yeah and, uh, somewhat of an easier three points for this Quakes side who, who were riding on a high a, a bit of an unbeaten run there and and five out of the six and the unbeaten run I think it was four uh, unbeaten in, in it, and almost for a whole month there uh, as well. You know, they're going to encounter some teams that will sit back uh, and try to play on the counterattack as well. Speaking with our colleague Robert Jonas, he, he said, you know, New England basically didn't have a plan. They just kind of bunkered in and, and sat in, which which they did, and, and they took their chances, you know, when, when they came to, to them, um, you know, I in that game. Um, you know, at, at the same time, and and, and you know, this is going to happen in, in this league, and it's 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 unique because of Matias Almeida's style of attacking and possessing with the football and being the protagonist, as he says that he's going to do. Um, somewhat of a mixed bag because at the same time, you can dominate possession, you can create lots of chances. The manager can give the quote that we just read, which is which is good. But again, yes, it is three points kind of down the tube there. Right, exactly. And I, I think uh, the biggest alarm here was the fact that the Quakes weren't really able to generate any clear attacking opportunities despite holding on to, uh, you know, that a lot of that possession, right? They weren't really able to utilize Danny Hoosen all that much. And he's been he's been a bit absent in the last couple of games as well. And, you know, they aren't playing with Cristian Espinosa, though. And I think, you know, that that is kind of the, you know, the red flag here is that without him, they aren't really able to create. They're a completely different team. Today, a colleague of ours asked Matias Almeida if there's some sort of dependency, you know, with the Earthquakes and Cristian Espinosa, that without Cristian Espinosa, this team really isn't able to flourish. And Almeida wasn't hesitant uh, to, to contradict that notion, right? He does know that a lot of this team's attack is effective solely because of Espinosa. He's a player that the Quakes just 
don't have in the bench, right? He's a player that is really, really hard to replace. And without him, as we saw on Saturday, it's going to be tough for, for the Quakes to counter teams who sit back and play, you know, two blocks of four. Yeah, I mean, th I mean that, that is one negative, obviously, the dependency factor. And we're going to have to monitor this dis dependency factor because you and I have chatted so much about Espinosa and how dynamic he's been for this team and how much he's impressed us, uh, you know, with the pedigree that he that he has and the experience that he has playing in South America, playing in Spain, now coming to North America and playing in Major League Soccer. I mean, it seems like he is getting his footing with this team. And so, you know, every single step of the way, he's been one of those consistent guys that we've always chatted about him and Daniel Vega. Um, you know, he's in that top three category of most consistent players and usually first on the team sheet, right? Um, a, a couple of positives and takeaways from from uh, this match, though. Uh, Calvillo started. Um, Said Haji had his had his debut, which is which is awesome. Uh, you know, he he played in college soccer as well, um, and so you know, nice to see a college soccer kid uh, get uh, in the Quakes side. Um, you know, as well um, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. It was. I, I thought it was a, a pretty decent, you know, uh, debut for for Haji. Had been, you know, playing with Reno for a bit and then training with the team, and finally he was called up due to largely due to Espinosa's absence. Same reason why Calvillo was able to start the game in a more in a, of a of a right midfielder, which isn't really his position. You know, he's he's a, a, an, an eight, you know, kind of a box to box midfielder. But they were both able to bear fruit from the Argentines' absence. And I think that Haji definitely took advantage of that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if we see him a little bit more with this side during the, the U.S. Open Cup run that, you know, eventually the Quakes will be a part of in the fourth round. Yeah, we'll get to U.S. Open Cup in, in a little bit. Uh, let's talk about Vaco because Vaco seems to be a huge talking point. As, as a designated player, he's not in the side and he's not on the team sheet and he's not often picked he hasn't been in the side for a while and you know we've kind of hinted and alluded towards this but he, he did score he scored late on as, as the quakes you know needed to score some goals but where does vaco fit right now with the san jose earthquakes team i mean this is a hot topic point it should be a it should be a major talking point given the fact that vaco is the one who's running away with the bag per se you know he's making 1.5 million dollars a year he is the black and blues only true designated player and he is nowhere to be found right he is nowhere to be found at all he hasn't uh he hasn't started a game since that defeat against lafc which you know ironically is when the quakes started to win you know, it, it was it was after that game, after LAFC, that, you know, they kind of slapped each other in the face and they realized we can't keep playing like this. We can't afford to keep yeah. playing like this. But I don't know. Maybe we're, maybe we're reading too much into it. But today, Matias Almeida did assess Vaco's status. He was asked what he thought of his performance by a colleague of ours, Jamin Moore. And Almeida replied that he didn't really rate his performing, performance against the Revs that he did like some of the dribbles that he had and obviously the goal that he had, but he didn't really look much into it. And that strikes me a little bit because when Almeida spoke about Yule, when he spoke about Haji, and when he spoke of other players today, his body language is, was a bit warmer, was a bit more convincing. But when he spoke about Vaco, he kind of turned cold and mm. kind of brushed it aside. I don't know. I don't know if I'm stretching it too far, but I, I think this should be asked. Is Vaco living his last few days in San Jose? It could be a possibility. He hasn't played, and this is not what you want from a designated player. And, you know, needless to say, Vaco has never been the type of player who has really identified, you know, with the team that he's played for. Reason why he's been bouncing from team to team and reason why he was never really able to make this connection with San Jose. I wouldn't be surprised if Vaco was in fact, you know, experiencing his last couple of, of games with the Quakes and could probably be shipped in during the summer. 
I, I do know firsthand that over the winter he had a couple of different offers from Israeli clubs, big Israeli clubs who you know could potentially creep into Europa League or Champions League. Now I. I I, I just we're just gonna have to wait and see what's gonna happen, but you know this definitely should be talked about because, like I said, Vaco is just a player that hugely, hugely influences the economical part of the San Jose Earthquakes. And it's really interesting because we started off this season chatting about Vaco and the attacking prowess that he has, and the creativity that he has, and the way that he can change games and the fact that he was one of the best attacking players, not knowing a lot of total information about how Cristian Espinosa was gonna play, or not knowing totally how this manager was gonna set up his side. But it's slowly looking like, Joel, every single week, that Vaco is becoming the fall guy, basically, and slowly being pushed out by this manager. And I, and I think you're right, I do think that his days in San Jose are numbered. I've always liked Vaco. I think Vaco, you know, has shown flashes of brilliance, but he hasn't done it consistently week in and week out for the San Jose Earthquakes. And, you know, I, I, I think the fans are looking for someone to be the fall guy, and he's currently fitting into that mode, especially with, you know, some reports of his attitude as well and, and showing that he might not care as much as the other players, uh, you know, either. So uh, I think it's something that, to keep our eye upon and something to, to mark for the rest of the next coming weeks, and I'm sure we'll, we'll bring it up. But let's move on to a huge positive note for the San Jose Earthquakes, Jackson Ewell, who is absolutely performing wonderfully for this team. His IQ off the charts, lots of things to chat about with him, and Matias Almeida has some very interesting comments and a quote to say about him as well. Almeida said, I think he's one of the players with the brightest futures in this league, especially being born in the United States. I like his personality a lot. In terms of soccer, he is very complete, and I see a big European future for him. He's a player that trains very well, and when he plays in games, he plays the same way he trains. He plays well in training sessions, friendly matches, and in easy and difficult matches. He always plays with the same effort, and it shows that he is a national team player. Those were the words from Matias Almeida, full of praise for Jackson Ewell, a player who was able to sneak into the U.S. men's national team under 23, potentially a cog for that Olympic team in a year's time. And now, you know, from other pundits around the league, from well-known analysts, could he potentially be called up for Burt Halter's Gold Cup roster? I think... Um, you know, this is a player, like I mentioned to you, who is, you know, grabbing a lot of attention, making headlines subtly, right? Not aggressively, but subtly. He's he's squeezing his way in there, and I think deservingly so. He's been able to, you know, really, really dictate the pace of the game in the heart of the field. He's been able to be that box-to-box -box player that Matias was dreaming of, and he thought he had under Aníbal Godoy, and Aníga, and, 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 sorry, in Godoy, but once Jutson was, you know, sidelined due to an injury, he slots in, he pushes Godoy back, and then he slots in Jackson Yule, and he's, he's done it magnific magnificently. I think we've talked about Jackson Yule a fair amount of times in here, and like I said, I, I don't think he's a revolutionary player, and, I, and I, will, I will back that, you know, to my last day, but, but the thing is, is that he does the small things right, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's a player with with great, great, you know, um, fundamentals, you know, he's a player that doesn't overcomplicate things. He has a beautiful, beautiful diagonal ball. He has great vision. He has, you know, great soccer IQ that you can't, you know, you can't teach. And these are the reasons why I believe Almeida really sees a future for Jackson Ewell, not only in our country and in our league, but abroad in Europe, you know, in the highest realms of soccer, Almeida, who's done it in that same scenario, believes that Jackson is going to be there one day. Yeah, Jackson is a complete player. He can play in any of the three midfield positions. We actually haven't seen too much of him as an attacking out-and-out -out number 10, but when you play with two sixes, such as Judson and Anibal Godoy, you have the freedom to have a box-to-box -box player like Jackson that can do the running, 
and and be able to attack. And in my my you know mind of things, I, I see the midfield three with those three guys being the fulcrum of it. To be fair with you, and I don't think that we've seen even the best of Jackson Yule. To be fair, I, I I think we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg when it comes to to Jackson Yule. His IQ when it comes to being on the field is off the charts. He reminds me of a young Frank Lampard, box <laughs> to box. The goals aren't there just yet, but the assists and the way that he reads the game, the way that he's able to dictate in the engine room in central midfield it is very Lampard-esque. It's not too brilliant. It's not too flashy, but it's, again, everything right. He does everything right. And uh, you know, and he has the mentality as kudos well. Kudos to him. Yeah, yeah, he has the mentality, and Almeida elaborated that uh, to us. You know, the fact that he sat him down and he talked to him, you know, one on one, and you know, obviously not verbatim, but what I'm trying to paraphrase here is what Almeida told us that he told him, which was, "Look, you have a spot within the team. It is yours to keep. You know, you you control your destiny. You control." how consistent you want to be and i think jackson is the type of player you know who is going to take advantage of that he knows that almeida is on his side now he knows that his spot is sealed it's there for him to take advantage of and the one thing that a lot of people probably question uh about jackson you coming into this league from ucla was his physicality was his build was he able to consistently do this in mls and he's got it down. I mean, the guy's put probably 10 pounds of muscle, you know, over the off season. Uh, you know, he's been able to run up and down the field with ease. Again, not only a position, but, you know, a position within a system that requires a lot of physical, uh, you know, hardships. So he's been able to get that down. Like you said, maybe he needs to take a couple more cracks at goal. But he, he, you know, he does also have a really wicked right foot that at any time can catch any goal, goalie, uh, you know, out of concentration. So, you know, that, that possibility is there as well. And I don't see why Jackson in a year or two, you know, shouldn't be in, in Europe. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting comment from this manager, too. And you and I were just speaking before we went on air about how this manager has never really made a comment like that about one of their players. And... This is an American player as well, and let's be cautious. I think we're, you know, we're in an interesting time period when it comes to Americans in Europe. I think in previous times we've been in a position of, oh my gosh, well, you know, this guy's the next best thing, or don't don't talk too much, don't ruin their stock, you know, this kind of thing. But I think now it's safe to say, with a manager that puts that backing behind this player, why not? And you know. From Matias Almeida's perspective, I think it really lights a fire within Jackson to be able to perform week in, week out, whether it's as a holding midfielder, whether it's a box-to-box -box role, or it's right underneath the striker in the number 10 spot. Yeah, well, with all due respect, you know, it's it's not Dominic Kinnear saying this about Jackson Ewell. Right. It's not Mikel Stare saying this about Ewell. It's Matias Almeida, El Pelado. He's lived soccer every day of his life it seems and he's been at the highest you know most prestigious stages the champions league he's played for inter he's you know he's been in spain he's been with the argentine national team he's been at two world cups and as a coach he's achieved great success as well while developing players while developing players he knows the path he knows what it was like he's been there as a player and as a coach so you know obviously the words that come from him should mean a lot to you. Yeah, and the Quakes uh, take on Chicago coming up this weekend. A couple of absentees, though, on the Chicago end, though, Joel. Yes, uh, no Raheem Edwards, it sounds like, and certainly no Nico Gaitan, who won Player of the Week last week, has been really turning things up for Chicago Fire, but they still have a couple of pieces. You know, they have Dax McCarty, and they have Bastian Schweinsteiger obviously pulling strings, and then up top they have... Uh, Frankowski, they have Katai, they have Nikolic, who won, you know, the Golden Boot a couple seasons ago. So the Chicago Fire, you know, with or without Gaitan, are still going to pose as a tough task for the Quakes now. The Quakes are going to have to come back home to Avaya, and they're going to have to, you know, keep that Avaya Castle run going on. It's been three matches in a row that the Quakes have, you know, gained positive points from at, in San Jose. So... 
it, it's it's going to be a tough task, but you know, let's let's see what happens. Yeah, 12:30 p.m. kickoff on Saturday, May 18th. That's kind of a little bit of an earlier kickoff for this side. The last time they had a kind of a kickoff time like that was against LAFC. So hopefully we'll see if the Savaya Castle can <laughs> continue. But as we talk about it, and we'll talk about it, and I'll say it every single time I'm on this show, you got to pick up points at home. And when you're on the road, ties are fine. A couple wins are good. Losses are going to happen. But when you're at home, when you're in front of the home fans, when you're at Avaya Stadium, Things are looking up, and they have to be because you got to put on a show for your home fans. And for you, the fans, I think things at home have been okay. Uh, just a note for you guys as we continue on with the show, keep your questions coming along. We've got a couple of questions in here already, but we want to keep your questions kind of coming along. Uh, I'm going to take this first question here from Jeff Vikos. He says, any idea what may have been Almeida's idea on the Calvillo experiment at right mid. When do you expect to see Lopez either at left back or on the wing next? Yes, so like I mentioned uh, just earlier, he was in a way forced to start Calvillo, you know, at a right mid position. He he has liked what he's seen from Calvillo. He said that after the match against uh, Rayados, you know, that he was really impressed with Calvillo. And he also did say that he expects Calvillo, like Haji, to be integral pieces, you know, of, of this Quake side in, in the coming years to come. Now, the thing with Lopez is is a little is a little gloomier, right? We don't really. Yeah. I asked about his progress because he did um, come up with an injury, I believe, in in his right knee, and he said that you know. It's, it's going to take time. I, I don't know if he's going to be able to play against the Chicago Fire, but I did also mention to him that is it is it possible for the Quakes fans to you know start giving up on this player? Is it time to be worried about the progress that the Peruvian has not had in San Jose? And he said that he needs time. Lopez needs time to adapt to the league. He needs time to assimilate to the country, to the language, to the style uh, of play here in the States, and that he he surely believes that in time, Lopez will be able to to be a breakout player in this league. Yeah, I, 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 th I think so too. I th I've liked what I've seen from Lopez. Uh, unfortunately, he's definitely hit a bit of a bump here in the tracks. I think it's been injury and then a little bit of the discipline with the red card kind of uh, hit him a little bit early. And I think that that's turbulent for a player that's just come into the side. Again, you and I were really raving about him when he first started. And I think that that can really hurt the stock of a player, especially when they come into the side, their first choice left back, and then all of a sudden there's a little injury bug here and there, and they're not fully fit again. And then you pick up a red card. It's it's tough. It's challenging. But I will say Lopez is a, is a modern left back. He likes to get up and down down the lines and he's extremely comfortable with the ball at his feet. This side right. plays with the ball at their feet and they're asked to dribble out of the back. It's not like the old days anymore where you're an old center back and you just clear the ball out yeah. or you're a left or right back and you just clear the ball out. Modern football, folks, is dribbling out of the back and being comfortable with the ball out of the back and almost getting into your opponent's half in that fashion. So I think Lopez, I'm going to give him a little bit of a break, and I hope he sorts it out, figures it out, because, you know, Matias Almeida really wanted him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they went out all the way to Peru to, to sign, you know, to sign him to a deal. But I think the problem with Lopez is the fact that he wanted to hit the ground running, and he really wanted to make a statement for himself when he joined the Quakes and when he got that first start at the start of the season. You know, the first game, he was he was solid and then after that he started to get a little too daring right going into some meaningless challenges you know trying to really just explode on that left flank and keep in mind though he, this is a player who's you know who's a bit versatile he he played as a left back for Sporting Cristal and then he was able to move up to the left wing as well which is a position that he hasn't played for uh here in San Jose but i think you know we, we could get caught up and say, you know, maybe it's time to panic. This player isn't going to work out, but it's going to take a little bit of time with him. You know, I've always said that I like what we see from Lopez. I think yeah. we both agree on that. Let's just see what happens. I, I, I say not rush it, 
give it a little bit of time. There's competition for the position that he's trying to uh, earn, which is good. And that will, you know, only elevate Lopez's uh, play. Yeah, uh, from Emmanuel WR, it's not exactly a question, but it's more of a comment that I'm going to turn into a question. And I think it's important because this is coming up, and it has to do with the Gold Cup. For the upcoming Gold Cup, we expect some players to leave like the Panamanians and maybe Lima or Jackson. Hopefully we get some plays and play our existing players like Felipe. So um, where does the Gold Cup kind of hit this team? It's going to hit kind of deep, uh, you know, in many ways, you know, with, with plenty of starters and, you know, some players that are really kind of coming into the side and impressing this coach. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we spoke about this uh, a little bit last week regarding international duties, right? Uh, the international, uh, you know, friendly window. In this case, it's not friendly. It's more of a competitive window because you have, you know, international tournaments going on in South America and Europe, North America as well. Specifically, the Gold Cup, which is going to confiscate a couple of players from the Quakes, like Aníbal Godoy, like Harold Cummings. If uh, Nick Lima gets in there as well, that could be that's that's a possibility too. Then you have Jackson Yule, who you know obviously isn't in contention, but a lot of people would like him to be, and that is certainly a stretch, but it's also a possibility. So it is going to hurt. And then you also have the Georgians, right? You have Vako and you have Guram, who at any you know they they can be called up to the Georgian national team as well. It's going to hurt the Quakes, and it's really, really going to test out the depth of the team. Are the Quakes deep enough, you know, to stay afloat in the West? And I think they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to make the team that much deeper around that time as well during the summer transfer window, which could yeah. largely benefit depending on how they play their cards and depending on, you know, if they're able to squeeze in a couple transfers in before, you know, things really ramp up. Uh, on an international basis, then they can give themselves a bit more of a cushion. But, you know, it's 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 going to be it's going to be a tough period for them. And to be fair, I think that this coach is still trying to figure out what kind of pieces he has and who's able to perform on the field. And with the U.S. Open Cup coming up, you know, this will allow excuse me, the U.S. Open Cup and the Gold Cup coming up, it'll allow him to, to figure out who he really wants in the side, who he wants to get rid of in the side, as well as. Uh, you know, talk with the general manager, Jesse Fiorinelli, about who should be shipped and who they should uh, bring into this side. And obviously they are, you know, actively searching for players to be in this side. Uh, it's not a complete side. He's still trying to build. Jeff Vikas wants more. Joel, you mentioned last week that we were interested in Osvaldo Alanis. Any other players of interest or positions we may be targeting in the summer? Um, as of this moment, I have yet to hear about any other player, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of other names came up in the coming weeks. I do know from experience that, you know, Jesse and co do a very, very extensive search of, you know, the players and the positions that they want to fill. It's, it's going to take a little bit of time though. You know, we're, the, the primary window just closed. And here we have this gap where, like I said, the the Quakes management is going to be working night and day, maybe making a couple flights, you know, maybe making a couple phone calls in order to find, you know, the players that the team wants. But it's going to be a bit easier than other times. It, it's it's going to be a little more rudimentary given the fact that they have a person within the locker room that certainly is calling most of the shots and that's Almeida himself. He's the one who's pulling the strings when before it was a little bit more on uh, Jesse's plate. He was the one who really reached out. He's the one who, who made the final call and it wasn't so much that he was, you know, listening to his managers on what players um, were wanted to bring in. And now, now it's Almeida, you know, singling out, couple of players like he did with Osvaldo Alanis. He's he's certain that he wants to bring them. And that is going to be a bit a bit of a of a struggle there because from reports uh, all over Mexico, it, it sounds like Alanis might be headed to Chivas as well. So I'm sure the Quakes and Chivas are going to go at it for Alanis there. Yeah, uh, keep your 
comments and questions uh, coming along here. We'll get to maybe one or two of them. Just wanted to touch on the second round of the U.S. Open Cup. We had El Farolito uh, that beat Joel's team last week, Akidemika, host Fresno FC of USL Championship. And I was at the game. I got a chance to uh, to watch the game and do a little coverage. And uh, here's a little clip, a little match recap for you. I talk a little slower than I do on this show. So uh, enjoy. A windy and a blustery afternoon here in the second round of the US Open Cup at Boxer Stadium as El Farolito hosted Fresno FC. A scoreless first half. It was quite tepid and a little bit of a pedestrian pace, if you will, to this game. And in the second half, things definitely picked up. A couple of yellow cards here and there, some half chances. But the tie was eventually settled in the 74th minute by Cutis Lawal, who scored a goal after a bit of a mix-up from a throw-in from a bunch of Farlito players. Farlito, the home side, pushed and pushed, hummed and purred, tried to get themselves going in the end of the second half. Four minutes of stoppage time. They just didn't quit, but at the end of full time, it was Fresno FC 1, El Farlito 0. Fresno FC will be moving on to the next round of the U.S. Open Cup. So there you go. We have Fresno FC advancing to the next round. They'll play Sacramento or Reno in two weeks' time in the third round. And just a heads up, the fourth round is when Major League Soccer clubs come into the fold. If you're curious about the U.S. Open Cup, it'll be in the first or second uh, week of June uh, with those fixtures. But, uh, but a nice day for local football and uh, two you know, Northern California teams uh, uh, going at it. Our final question comes from our brethren, the Thin Factor, and uh, they write, looking dapper fellows, have thank we you. seen the end of Wando? Yes, thank you. Does he have a chance to break the record or are we moving on from that? Flashpoint question, Joel Soria. I don't think we've seen the end of Chris Wondolowski, um, at least not in this season. I, I don't think so. There's 20 games to be played or roughly around 20 games to be played. We have the summer period, as we just talked about, that is going to really, really limit the amount of players within the team and I think that's that that would be the ideal time to see Chris Wondolowski you know probably you know get back into the mix yes you are going to have Danny Husen still but I think Almeida will find a way to tinker him in and then not just that you know injuries can happen in soccer as well and you, you know Chris um, continues to be the fighting spirit of the team I, I'm, I'm still true you know, thoroughly convinced uh, about that. When he comes onto the field and even off the field, he's been able to embrace this new role, right? In a, in a positive manner. You know, he's, he's still a leader within the team. You hear it from Shea Salinas. You know, he's only the captain when Wando's not on the field. Wando is still the internal captain. And he, he will forever be, you know, the internal captain, right? Um, but I don't think we've seen the end of him. Uh, after this season, then I, I think... If, if the question is referring to, to that, then in that case, I would say yes. I, I find it really, really difficult uh, for Chris to continue on after 2019. But will he get his record? I, I, I think so. I, for him, I hope so, for his legacy. Um, you know, but to answer that question, I, I think we're still gonna see more of him this season. We've just got to channel your heartbeat as big as his heartbeat, and all the fans just have to think positively about Chris Wondolowski for him to break his record. I do think he'll break the record, but again, it just depends on when he can get on and get on the field. He's almost an assistant manager at this point, and I think he's going to be a great coach when he finally does hang up the boots. So anyway, uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Again, uh, you guys can always ask us questions, write some comments, concerns. Any comment is a good comment. Uh, we, we are an inclusive show. We want to answer your questions. We want to, um, you know, make sure that uh, we, we, we answer them for you. And, um, you know, you're a big part of our show. So 
Um, thank you so much. Um, a big shout out to our friends, The Fin Factor, who are shooting in this same studio right after us. Uh, our San Jose brethren is there in the playoffs uh, for our producer, Jason Scholl, associate producer, Aaron Scholl, uh, Joel Soria, Charles Wolin. Thanks so much for tuning into Black and Azul, and we will see you, see you guys. next week.